So for the last 13 years, Daniel Lawrence Wilson has explored and successfully executed presenting compelling visual media through music videos, commercials, and with his latest output, A Brush of Violence, he's beginning his journey to produce short films and hopefully will release a feature film in the future. So Daniel, how is life in a pursuit of happiness? Pretty good, can't complain. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for you getting on the phone because I know we've been having a little bit of back and forth about timing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad we were able to make it happen. So one of the things I've been kind of wondering as I've been watching some of the interviews you've done thus far is you're based out in L.A., but are you from St. Louis or is it that you just spent a, a certain amount of time in St. Louis? Yeah, so I lived in St. Louis for about eight years. And so I filmed this project there before moving out to Los Angeles. So I've been in L.A. for a year and a half now. So. I did a brush of violence, the entire production there uh, in the Missouri, greater St. Louis area, and then came out here um, about a year after filming uh, the film. So yeah. All right. And I was kind of wondering, like when it comes to the beginning, what was what led from you going from a fan of visual media, like movies, TV shows, to wanting to transfer over and actually be behind the camera? Um, it, it's just an, a medium that I was really interested in. It, it, it com combines a lot of things I'm interested in. So, so it's like cameras and technology and lighting and mood and music. And so I, I always liked movies, but um, it wasn't until I just started more experimenting with like editing and cameras that I realized, oh, this is actually a medium that combines a lot of my interests. So just through curiosity is what led me to Want, want to be behind the camera and make stuff. Were you one of those people that had that little flip um, video thing when it first came out or were you later on <laughs> getting into technology? No, yeah, so I, I've been kind of messing with it for like 15 years. So I definitely had a couple of flip cameras back in my day for sure. And even like the DV tapes and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's amazing seeing the like the te technical like breakthroughs over the last you know, 10 to 15 years and kind of coming up with like, uh, the industry changing as drastically uh, uh, as it has been. So yeah, it's been interesting. Okay. And from what I got, Quentin Tarantino is pretty much one of your top favorite directors, right? Um, I mean, I think everyone agrees that, uh, you know, he's kind of on the, the pedestal quite a bit, but um, yeah, like him, uh, uh, Christopher Nolan obviously is, is a big one. Um, you could probably sense some Fincher in my work as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, Tarantino, I mean, he's like one of the greatest for sure. With that in mind, I was kind of thinking as I was reading over your bio on your website, what led to you instead of going around some do where you just, you know, start directing, start writing and just go through that lane. Instead, you went to get a bachelor's in film and then a master's in entertainment. What led to you deciding to do a formal education rather than kind of learn as you go? Um, I mean, honestly, at the time, I kind of didn't know what I, what I wanted to do. And so I feel like through education, you can kind of accelerate um, the process a little bit. And so, you know, within a couple of years, I kind of realized what I, what I enjoyed and, and what I hated pretty quickly. And so I kind of decided to go that route. And then it was like a nice gateway of like, you know, moving to another city and meeting different people and having different life experiences. And so it was just something that felt um, like the right thing to do at that time in my life. And are some of the people you met in school, people you've worked with when it comes to a brush of violence, or even the, I think you did a short camp called Islaton? Yeah, yeah. So we did, we did like a smaller one, like back in 2016. Um, that was with the same DP as Brush of Violence, and then kind of a newer friend um, that wrote it, and then I co-directed it. Um, but yeah, that was like seven years ago. But yeah, that was just like a an experimental thing to see if we could just pull it off. And we we kind of we did a pretty good job. So it, it it gave me enough confidence to be like, oh, okay, that this turned out pretty good. Um now it's time to like kind of turn it up and actually do something of like a higher caliber. And so um at, at that point after I did that, it, it, it inspired me to start writing. And so um, I just been kind of like writing for fun for a couple of years and then during lockdown is when I wrote brush and I decided like, oh, this is something that I could, 
I could do and it felt right for what I wanted to do during that time. And so that's kind of like the last couple of years of, of discovery of, of doing that project. And I just want to touch on one more part of your history that I thought was real interesting is that you used to do music videos for people like Meek Mill, DJ Khaled, and stuff like that, but specifically within the Warner Music Group, right? Yeah, yeah. So like I did like a lot of like vlogging and, and music video work. Um, uh, so I lived in Florida during that time and there, there was like a big hip hop influence uh, in the Orlando area. And so, um, yeah, for like two years, I just did like a lot of hip hop videos. Um, I'm still doing them. I did one um, actually just like six months ago with my buddy Caskey, um, who was uh, at the time when I lived in Florida, like signed the cash money and universal uh, records. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I'm really in it as much as I used to be like 10 years ago. But yeah, I, I was really in the hip hop scene in Florida for a couple of years. Ooh. Now let's start to go into a brush of violence. I, one of the things that I've heard from your different um, interviews is the writing scene that came first in the casting, but I think it would be a disservice to not say the music plays a big part in the film. So when did that come into play? And how much did that inform either the casting or was it even part of the writing process when you was doing the film? Yeah, so um, it's funny you mention that because I think I showed the composer, I think the first person that saw this script and like my pitch deck was the composer. <laughs> so I was kind of like, music is a big part of my life and it, and it, and it still is to this day. And so I knew that if I wanted to pursue this story, that it needed this kind of uh, tone and feel. And uh, the composer for the film was Snakes of Russia. And so we met on Instagram about three years ago. And once I pitched him the idea, he was like, oh yeah, you like definitely have to do this. Um, and I was like, well, are you down, down to be a part of it? And he was like, yeah, let's do it. And so, yeah, he has, it's pretty crazy. I mean, there's, you know, 13 cracks of music in a 40 minute short. So it's kind of pulsing throughout the whole uh, arc of the story. But yeah, it just felt like it was right for me to, to, to go down that path of doing that much music with him. Um, but, it, but we we didn't write the music, start that process until, um, like I was probably a couple months in on on assembling the edit. So he knew about the story and 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 was patiently waiting for me to get to get to the steps of him getting involved. But yeah, he was a part a part of the project before he even like cast it or did any of the the process of like actually getting the production pulled together. And. From what I remember, you had over 1,500, not 1,500, 15,000 people who were auditioning for the lead role, or you was looking at for the lead role for Aquila? Yeah, so I think ultimately, like, I've never done casting before, and I just got completely obsessed with it because um, it's such a worldly idea that I didn't have the confidence in being like, okay, I'm going to cast. Um, people just from Missouri or Illinois or Chicago, like it needed to have like an international feel because the idea just called for that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I literally just got really, really obsessed with casting and probably spent like three months on it. But I used a website called Backstage and it was so much volume of people that I just needed to, to do it like in little bite-sized pieces. Mm -hmm. And so every day I'd wake up and I'm like, okay, casting is part of my coffee. And once the coffee's gone, we'll move on to back to the writing, back to locations, back to lighting and everything else. Mm -hmm. But it was like every day when I woke up, I'm like, okay, we're going to do casting. Um, and so after doing that for a few months, I ended up getting like around seven or 8,000 submissions to me that wanted to audition. But I personally looked at like fifteen or twenty thousand, like searching, um, and it just, I yeah, I just got completely consumed with it because it needed to have that that vibe, you know. And so, uh, yeah, I found her on backstage, like page sixty something, um, and it was just like 
a crazy experience like finding her because when i found her and i saw her face i was like oh that's the face like please be available please hopefully the profile is like not expired or whatever and then mm -hmm. i clicked on her profile and like did more research on her and like her, she's actually like an actual like photographer in real life and i'm like mm -hmm. this is fantastic and so yeah just a bunch of crazy weird miracles happen like that through the, through the casting process and now something else I was interested in, especially as I learned more about the production, that was one of her first times in front of the camera, right? Yeah, her first time. Yep. And then she was playing off of somebody who's been working off since about 2008. I think his name is Javor, is his first name? Yeah, Javor. So he's uh, from Bulgaria and he's got like uh, 20, over 25 years of acting experience. And so that was another thing too, is like, that was really crazy about him getting involved in the project was he moved to America and was going to move to Los Angeles, but COVID happened, which forced him into being in St. Louis for a little bit. And so he actually reached out to me about the role and I was like, Oh, I, I don't know. Like, I, it's kind of like, you know, going back to the idea of like, I need to have like an international like feel. I was like, Oh, this guy's from St. Louis. I don't know about that. His face looks interesting, so I looked at him and I'm like, oh my God, I'm from a different country. <laughs> like, this is so unique and odd, you know? And then I looked in his, his, uh, his IMDb and I'm like, oh, there's like a huge like resume here. And he speaks like seven different languages and like has so much experience. And so he was the only person that read for that role. Um, Cause I just, I like, once he read, I was like, this is so the guy, like, there's no question about it. And then we had a lot of good, uh, there's a lot of good benefits with that because me and him were able to get a lot of coffees and lunches and hang mm -hmm. out a lot and develop this character. So me and him got to spend like five months together before we could e even, even film a uh, brush. So he was able to go to the mansion with me. He was able to go to the studio and we're able to have just like, a lot of awesome long conversations and so that and was like directed too right yeah he's directed some stuff as well yeah he's done a couple features um but yeah it, it was another freaky casting thing that happened and how do you balance that your this is your second your first one was a short film this is more of a feature film and you have one person who's mostly been behind the camera and this is her first acting role and you have someone who's also have directing experience and he has a good acting amount of experience so how do you balance the newcomer with someone who kind of has more of a experience than you have in trying to bring all this together alongside pretty much handling the cinematography handling the editing you were the sole writer for this how did you bring that all together Honestly, it was just like a lot of prep. Like, I feel like the, like everything's made and the decisions are made like before you even get on set. And so, I mean, I had endless amounts of conversations with everybody um, to the point where I had a lot of confidence and like, we didn't really need to talk about much once we got to the day. So, you know, we prepped for, we shot in August and I decided I wanted to do this project in december and then i cast it and did all the prepping you know really hardcore like seriously for like three or four months and so there was just like an immense amount of prep i mean zoom calls and coffees and beers and dinners and it just it went on and on and on mm -hmm. um and i feel like that is a true testament to like the quality of the reason why it feels that way is because we just put so much work into the prep um and the thought and that sort of thing um when it came to like casting, like, you know, obviously Mia holds her own, like she's a confident badass. Mm -hmm. Um, and then Yavor, like, is just has so much skill. And so when I'm looking at the script, I was like, okay, I'm gonna cast with some strategy. And so Yavor having like a theater background and all of his experience, I'm like, oh, this guy's more than capable to hold his own on doing these long, you know, manic monologue rants that he does mm -hmm. um and then mia is just like so confident in herself um and there's not a lot of talking for her role there's a lot of like looking and a lot of reactional like type of moments for her i'm like she is more than capable of handling this um and it's kind of meta it's like mia is like an extension of Aquila, you know so 
yeah, there was just strategy with the casting whenever I whenever I was doing that before production. And with talking about how Mia and Akila kind of seem like an extension of each other, what is the origins of these characters? Are they based off of people you know? Did they come from a dream? Where did this all come from? Because I know St. Louis is part of the inspiration for the location, but what about the actual characters? Um, I guess they're just extensions of myself. <laughs> Like when I when I wrote the script, like I was in lockdown by myself basically, and so I was having a lot of like, you know, moments of thought of, you know, what is art, what is my art, what is life, what is mortality, you know, what do you leave behind, and so it was just like honestly, like the characters are just an extension of myself of of them just having conversations. You know, I'm kind of processing stuff with, through myself, through these characters talking to each other. Um, obviously, there's some inspiration with like such artists of like Van Gogh and like Banksy and Francis Bacon and like uh, Harry Benson and stuff. And so I'm, I'm borrowing and stealing from a lot of like past artists that I really like um, look up to and love their work and whatnot. So it's kind of just like a concoction of just like thoughts and things of me meditating along with like, oh, this is interesting, I could take this, this is interesting, I could take that. So yeah. uh, the first time I wrote, I, I started writing on this was the, the dinner scene. And it's just, you know, a long conversation about, you know, what is art and what do we leave behind? And yeah, so just like a med meditative like writing session for me. And with that noted, how did you handle pacing? Because I think you said originally the aim was to make this 20 minutes, but then expand it to 40 minutes eventually. So where did you find like the ebb and flow between let's spend a bit more time in this situation or have this kind of intense stare off, like when she's changing the different um, photographs to maybe shorten it, like when it comes to some of the more graphic scenes toward the end? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think my assembly edit that I had before my my full-time editor came on, Lexi Highland, uh, I think the edit was like 50 or 52. Um, I never intended it to be this length. I just wanted to make something that I loved and I, and I wanted to be the best representation of my capabilities and the story that we're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. And so, it, me, me and Lexi edited on this thing for a few months and we just kept watching every scene and just kept going and going and going and, and holding it. And it just ended up being that we felt like the 40 minutes was the best version of what it should be. Um, yeah, I, I fully intended it to be shorter, but you know, I know I'm getting kind of criticized on the internet of like this 40 minute thing. and. You know, I thought I thought the you know spoiler, alert, but I thought the guy killing himself would have been the most controversial thing about the piece. But come to find out, it's the runtime. <laughs> like I did a I did a post on Reddit, and everyone's like, 40 minutes, forty minutes. Like, what is this? Is it short? Is it a feature? Like, what is this?" Um, and I feel like at the end of the day, I'm just like happy with what we did, and um, I have no regrets uh, that it's a, a an odd forty minute like film. Yeah, because I remember you mentioning that you have you well at least at the time that you did an interview, I think in December, you was having issues with getting into the film festival circuit because of the forty minutes. Yeah, so basically, like festivals only want anything that's like ten or fifteen minutes, or they want a feature. Mm -hmm. And even before I uh, shot it, I had other directors telling me like, "Oh, you should do like a smaller version of this." Um, and even after I had the edit, I still had directors tell me, okay, this is really good, but like, you should do a smaller version. Um, and so I'm just like unapologetically just making whatever I want to make. Um, mm -hmm. As time goes on, these run times are going to become less and less irrelevant with the streaming era, streaming era that we're in right now. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to make what I wanted to make. And if people don't want to watch it because it's a weird run time, then don't watch it. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of good because it gets in, it establishes the characters, and then, that, as you spoiled, <laughs> he kills himself and then it moves out. It doesn't, there's no real fat when it comes to this. It's like a bison burger. You get nothing but meat with it. 
Yeah, it's like I I I could have probably done some form of a feature version of this, but it wouldn't have been that potent. It would have been this like slower dragged, you know, the budget was only 80 grand on this. And so it's like it would have been like uh not as a punch to the face that I wanted it to be, you know. Um, and then at the other side of it is like, I don't want to cut it down and do anything short. Like I wanted to do something that was impactful and longer and, you know, what limitations I had. So this is what I end up, ended up with and take it or leave it. Um, it's just like what I wanted to make. And moving a little bit beyond a brush of violence, I saw on your Vimeo because you have a Vimeo page, which has some of your work. You also have your YouTube page, which has some of the behind the scenes and interviews. And specifically on the Vimeo, you have a moment when you was at Tijuana, Mexico and Mexicali, when you was talking to some students about filmmaking. And I was kind of wondering if you could talk more about that experience. Yeah, no, it's awesome you saw that. I, for, I kind of forgot about that. Um, yeah, like I got uh, someone on Twitter found me and invited me to come down there to speak um, on the behalf of the US consulate. And so I went to Tijuana and Mexicali for a couple of days and got to go to like, um, I went to four colleges and spoke for like an hour each. Um, and it was just, it was more from like a commercial perspective and how to like run a business and, and basically like, how do you get started and how do you make money um, making the things that you want? Um, but yeah, it was, it was great, a great experience. Um, I'm actually speaking at another college here in LA uh, here in a couple of days. So. Yeah, I, I love I love giving back and doing that when I can because any moment I can inspire, I'm going to because people would do that whenever I was younger and it, it made an impact on me. So yeah, it's always fun to do that. Have you ever thought like maybe doing like Spike Lee does at NYU where you're both teaching and still doing filmmaking? I don't know if I'd want to get maybe that far into the weeds, but I mean, if the opportunity arose, maybe I'd consider it. But yeah, I haven't really thought about it like that before. It's more of just like popping in, popping out for a couple hours and, and hanging out with the students when I can. Okay. And considering the film festival circuit seems to be kind of difficult for pressure violence and you put the film on YouTube, how does that affect your marketing when it comes to this? Since I would assume it's now part of your, it's part of your thing that you have to do alongside the actors in order to really get the name out there for this film. Yeah, it was. That's another thing people can't <laughs> wrap their head around too, because you spend so much money and time on it, and then you just put it out. But I feel like, you know, I have my older film is on streaming, and it's just like it takes tens of thousands of uh plays to, to get a dollar back and i'm like you know what at the end of the end of the day like, the roi is this I mean, me and you wouldn't be doing this right now if i can just put it out there so okay. i've received like you know a pretty big amount of feedback um on reddit and youtube and instagram and stuff and so it's like you know this is a calling card this is a, a pilot this is a 40 minute short or feature however you want to look at it but this is like a a long enough impactful thing that's out there that will eventually, you know, but we'll we'll reap the benefits of it being out there like that. I, I'm I'm more than positive about it. So, yeah, I just wanted it to be very easy to watch, and so mm -hmm. that was the, that was the point. It was like, okay, let's just get it out there and move on to the next thing. Which is important because I've gone to so many film festivals, and there are some movies I've seen that never came out some shorts that had so much potential, but you can talk about them on your website or talk about them on Reddit, but no one has access to them. But yours mm -hmm. is 40 minutes, it's on YouTube, you can embed it onto your website so people can see it more easily. So that whole line between film festival goer who can spend hundreds of dollars to get there or even get a virtual pass to people who just love film but maybe can't afford it, this completely just obliterates that and just says, here's a quality film that has all the value that you expect, but of an accessibility that a lot of films like this don't really get to have. Because I'm assuming with film festivals, there's like some type of exclusivity, right? Where you can't put it on YouTube or Vimeo? Yeah, so we did do that. We, we did a whole film festival circuit. Uh, and so the film was actually finished like last June. 
-hmm. And so we did the whole circuit. And then, you know, we're actually still waiting to hear back from like six or seven festivals right now. But mm -hmm. I'm just like, I don't want to wait any longer. Like, I'm trying to grow as an artist. I'm trying to, to move on. I'm trying to explore other projects. Mm -hmm. And I just don't want to keep, um, you know, quote unquote, milking this, this one thing that we did this one time. Like, I'm happy with the result. It was a great experience. But you know, you gotta, you gotta move on and get on to the next thing, you know, cause mm -hmm. you can get in the cycle of festivals and you're just waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting. You're like, man, I could have already posted this a year ago and been maybe releasing another thing by now, you know, cause you're just like constantly marketing and putting money into the festivals. And it's like, you know, rather than just like hanging your hat up on one thing, it's like, just keep going and keep making stuff. Um, I don't know if I'll ever do festivals ever again um it's been that bad of an experience no i just i just don't like waiting you know we only got so much time on this planet and i'm just like you know if i if i had a big feature film i was like five to ten million dollars or whatever it's like yeah. i need to try it or if i have like a big actor or something it's like okay let's take a swing but uh if it comes down to making shorts like i just did with brush it's like i think i would rather just post it and move on to the next thing um because you're, you're kind of like in you're like in jail a little bit you know you're just like waiting and waiting and and then it happens and you know we got in the one festival and it was cool but it was just like okay like it didn't do much for me you know so i i would rather like i'm just trying to grow as an artist and not wait um you know a year to think to get told no so uh, so what is where I'm at right now. So what is the appropriate amount of time after you finish something to dedicate to it and promoting before you move on to the next thing then? Uh, that's a great question. I guess it just depends on, on how much money you put into it, how much, how long it is, the hype. Yeah. Like, I don't know, maybe like a month or something like that, but, um, yeah. Uh, I, I'm glad we went through the festival circuit at the end of the day with Brush because now I don't I don't have any regrets or like, oh maybe we could have done it or whatever. But yeah, and and then my mindset will change later. But right now I'm I'm in the like let's make stuff and post it mode, you know. Mm -hmm. And one last question before we get to the final five, I believe you mentioned that you had. In one of your interviews, you had about four to six scripts, and a brush of balance was like number four. So, what's going on with those other ones? Are they sort of in flux right now? Are they in development, pre-production? Where are they at? Yeah, so I'm I'm, I'm considering what should be next right now. Um, brush was so demanding of of me on so many levels that I'm like, okay, you know, this thing's been out for less than a month. Um, I have two shorts that I like, and then a feature that I like, and they're all in various different forms right now. And I mm -hmm. did, I wrote, uh, two of them before brush and one after brush. And so they're in different stages right now, but I think at this point, like this was such a big project for me that I'm just going to spend probably the rest of the year just dreaming and writing and thinking about, okay, like, what, what should be next? Um, and then probably at the end of the year or next year is when I'll commit to something. But right now, I'm just kind of like enjoying the dream, the daydreaming process um, of writing and thinking and that sort of thing. Because I feel like the reason why this film turned out so good is because I didn't, I didn't have a lot of pressure on myself to be like this, 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 this. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, once I would, once I decided I was going to marry it and commit to it, I was like, okay, but now the pressure happened. But I'm kind of enjoying this like uh moment of you know the possibility of like what's next and so that's kind of like where i'm at right now with it um so kind of enjoying this win right now and then um probably towards the end of this year i'll, I'll decide what i'm going to commit to next so yeah i have a few things that i'm considering at this point in time okay and now for our final five questions with the first question being who or what inspires you to continue Uh, probably my friends and my family. 
um, I, I'm surrounded by like a lot of love and, and I, I have a lot of amazing artists in my circle. And so I always say probably my friends and are the ones that inspire me to, to go. We all have like our small wins together. Um, yeah, that'd be my answer. It'd be like my friends because we're all artists and we're all making stuff and that inspires me to, to keep creating. All right. The next question is, do you feel like in your field, you have started to gain ground and get comfortable? Am I comfortable? Mm, or at least you feel like you're getting acclimated to the process way that you're on, the process that you're um, doing. It. I would say no. I mean, I pushed myself so hard on this last one. It was, that's probably why I'm like chilling for a little bit because <laughs> I'm not, it's like, I mean, that was like, you know, it, it was like a year and a half of, of my life getting that thing together. And so no, I mean, I'm not comfortable at all. I actually like, don't like being comfortable. I like pushing myself like all the way to the edge on everything that I do. And so, um, yeah, I, my, I'm too obsessed to be comfortable. So I would say absolutely not. <laughs> Um, the next question is, what is one thing if someone were to follow your path, you tell them they must do and what they must avoid? Um, you must believe in yourself and you must have your tribe. You can't do any anything like this alone. Like you need, you need your friends to support you because um, you're gonna second guess yourself a lot and hit a lot of roadblocks and i feel like if you have a tribe of like 20 30 people that are all in this similar field then you can got you can accomplish anything as a group this is a, a true test of that um and one thing to avoid mm -hmm. well it doesn't have to be just one but what's something you think is like a major thing if someone wants to become a filmmaker like you what they need to avoid um be careful what you consume because like I'm a big believer in that. Just be aware of what you're consuming with media and television and books and podcasts because um, it can influence what you make. The next question is, as of where you are now, where do you see room for growth? Are great questions, man. Um, <laughs> what do I see in myself of growth? Um, like in the next film, which you maybe do less roles and just focus on directing and writing, maybe hand off editing to someone, since it seems as much as you like the challenge of being consumed, it also seemed to kind of like burn you out doing all this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it wasn't something out of, um, out of me. I mean, I am a control freak, but there was just times where I'm like, okay, I got to do this or it's not going to happen. So yeah, I would say room for growth would be probably having a co-writer or definitely like a co-producer because producing and directing at the same time was immensely challenging on set. Can you elaborate, elaborate a little bit more into that? Because I know you said it was an $80,000 budget. Casting took you about three to five months for your lead, who's going to be handling a lot of the marketing because she's the face of the film. And then, of course, you had to do editing, and then there was actual filming. I think you had to get a grant or something to help with the production costs. So, kind of elaborate on everything it kind of took to get to that. Kind of made this a lot to be both the director and also the producer. Yeah. So it's just you know the four to five months of planning, you know, it's just, it's locations and logistics and casting and crew and lighting and lenses and um, dozens and dozens and dozens of decisions that have to be made, you know, production insurance, props, the car, all the houses, you know, all that stuff. So it was just a lot to, to, to get together, uh, especially with such a budget uh, of a project. Um, but when it just came down to like getting on set, like I was the most knowledgeable individual of the material because I wrote it, produced it, and mm -hmm. going on set was directing it. And so, you know, there's just a lot of challenging moments where, um, you know, you're the leader of a group, and so you got to you got to do a lot. But there were moments where, um, you know, something would be happening, 
on set, I would be directing something and then something would come up that was going to conflict uh, a shoot day like three days from now. Mm -hmm. And so while I'm directing on set and working with the actors and DP and stuff, someone like my assistant would come over and be like, oh, hey, like we don't have like, these chairs and the table for Thursday now, what should we do? And so I, I would be on set directing them and I'd be with my assistant like Craigslist or on the internet, like looking for new furniture. <laughs> and so it's just like a lot of like that kind of stuff. And then like, um, you know, like a location would have questions or whatever. And so I'm like on the phone talking to them while being on set. And so it was just like incredibly challenging, like a balancing act, like being the producer and the director at the same time. So yeah, it'd be something that I would probably like to have in the future. It's just like a more like, uh, more of a partner in the producing side of things because they could put in players out and I wouldn't even know that that's even happening while trying to focus on, you know, getting the scene done. Okay. And the last question is, in the long run, what do you want your legacy to be? <laughs> These are awesome. Um, I just want my legacy to, to be, you know, I want to be just known as a person that inspired and shown people that things were possible, even with, you know, you're always constrained. So my legacy is just like, yeah, inspiring and can show people that you can, you can do things if you just put your mind to it. Okay. I want to thank you again for meeting with us. And just as a reminder, A Brush of Violence is available on YouTube. And there's a whole lot of other videos for people to see your work on not only YouTube, but also on your Vimeo channel. Yep. And we'll be doing, um, probably releasing three or four more, more videos in the coming weeks. Um, another interview with the cast. And then we got like a behind the scenes of a mural and like a photo shoot and stuff like that. So there'll be more stuff releasing over the next week or two. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a good day.